Thank you very much. That lays the framework for us. Now we have a 40 minutes of time for the panel discussions. We start with the questions that are laid on the screen for us there. How can green infrastructure take up be fostered to address hydromorphological modifications as well as floods and drought risks? Let's please try to keep our answers to the suggestions that are given in the blueprint. And I will start with Xavier. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't know if it works. You hear me? Yeah, OK, that's OK. Thank you very much for giving the floor. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to, to talk to you today and have a, a debate at this table about uh, this uh, very important question. Uh, as I am the representative of Hydropower at this table, maybe uh, I don't have the easiest, the easiest place, but I'll try to, to speak with you about uh, hydromorphological uh, uh, impact of Hydropower and the issue of uh, the quality and quantity management of water. Uh, first, I would like to say that uh, in my organization, and I think now in most of uh, hydropower organization, uh, we totally agree with the goal of working in a more and more resource efficient way and in building uh, an economy, uh, a sustainable economy regarding water issue. It's now understood as a very important issue among most of the people and most of the company in the hydropower uh, field. And it's important to say that first. Uh, for example, uh, we have an international uh, hydropower association, EHA, we work, we, which works a lot about uh, sustainable hydropower and which stress upon this question of uh, hydromorphological uh, question regarding hydropower schemes. And uh, last year in Marseille, during the uh, World Water Forum, uh, we uh, led an initiative uh, around the water, what we call the water, energy, food and env environment nexus to deal with this question. I think it's very important. It's a very important but also a very difficult and tricky issue. Uh, quite a lot has already been done in this question in the framework of the first water framework directive. A river machine management plan implementation, river morphology restoration has been highly challenged and various requirements regarding the improvement of water morphology have been made across Europe. This includes river bank restoration or reinforcement, remindering, wear removal, river dynamics modification and sediment continuity restoration through both structural and water management measures. It includes, of course, also fish migration work such as fish passes and fish lifts, which are very important in our, in our jobs. So, and among the solution, we have the conviction that green infrastructure and especially natural water retention measures and the restoration of river bank and the restoration of sediment continuity are important parts of the solution. But even if several things have already been done, uh, all these measures require a high level of knowledge of hydrological, hydromorphological and geomorphological processes, but also biological and ecosystems processes. And we need to better understand all this knowledge and to better understand the interrelationship between these questions. And it's a quite a tricky issue, of course. And we feel that uh, there is still a lack of knowledge in the interrelationship between these questions. Thus, R&D and experimentation is still necessary, and this is the first point I would, I would like to stress upon today. The second question is prioritization. We have probably a lot to do on many river basins in Europe, on many river basins in Europe, across Europe, in many countries, probably in all countries in Europe on this question. And the way to prioritize some measures more than others is, in my opinion, a very important question. First, we have a question about cost benefits and cost efficiency of the measures. Of course, we can do a lot, but the question of the prioritization, I, I said that, and the question of cost efficiency and cost benefit of the measure with which we start, it's a key question. So I think we have to address this question of and R&D, the question of prioritization and the question of cost benefit and cost efficiency of the measures if we want to succeed and if we want to have uh, uh, results and good results and good results for water in uh, quite a couple of, of years. Developing technical and scientific collaboration between operators, regulators and many stakeholders in sediment research program on experimental basins 
where morphological restoration has to be challenged is probably the best way to progress and to fill the gap between the lack of knowledge and the need to better assess the effectiveness and the appropriateness of the measure. That's why we propose that we launch uh, and we select uh, some river basin to be experimental zone and that we launch a, a multi-stakeholder initiative between all the stakeholders of the river basin and of course the regulators and the operators to test and act in a real way on this question of hydromorphological question. And finally, I will finish with a concluding remark, in fact. Uh, we, are, we are speaking of green infrastructure and we are convinced that green infrastructure is part of the solution, an important part of the solution. But we can also look at this question, at this issue, in another way. And we could wonder whether classical infrastructure can be used and seen in a greener way, but used in a greener way. That means integrated in a river, management, river basin management system that could permit and allow to use classical infrastructure in a more greener and more respectful way regarding water. Saying that, I think about, of course, multipurpose hydro scheme, which were not always designed at the beginning to be multipurpose hydro scheme, but can be used as multipurpose hydro scheme where good, good integrated in the river basin management plans. And they have a lot of use and uh, benefit to bring regarding water for our environment, water for agriculture and every needs about water, and of course water for our environment. And that's, and of course they can use, be used also for drought management plans. So I think we have part of the solution in green infrastructure, of course, and we have part of the solution in using in another way classical infrastructure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Xavier. Each of our panelists are practitioners in different areas, and so we'll get some responses from uh, the panel members. We'll run down the panel now with about two or three minute responses. Obviously a big call for R&D now, but in some cases I think some of the people on the panel might say we've, we've done a lot of analysis on existing river basins. Yeah, thank you very much. And as uh, was said at the outset, I'm not Marcus Simoner, and uh, he represents an institution very different than the one that I represent, which is the International Commission for the Protection of the Danube River. But it's not so different in the sense of what we would say. And in fact, I read the statement that he would give here. Uh, he comes from the navigation sector, the waterway administration in Austria, which also has responsibility under what is called the Danube strategy for the promotion of navigation in region. The message that I would give is going to be the same because we've had a very intensive dialogue process together for the last six, seven years where representatives from the environment sector and the hydro, or sorry, the navigation sector have discussed together how improvements in navigation can come about at the same time as uh, an improvement of the environmental conditions. And uh, as you see from the statement that Marcus has given in the, the written statement in the um, meeting documents is it is possible to have win-win scenarios. It is possible for sectors to be integrated. It is possible to achieve green infrastructure, uh, infrastructure that is developed to improve navigation at the same time improves the environmental conditions and meets the, the goals of the Water Framework Directive. The process that we have undertaken uh, led to a document called the Joint Statement on Guiding Principles for Development of Inland Navigation and Environmental Protection. And the main elements of that were it had to involve the, all the actors in basically agreeing with one another on what were the principles under which development can happen, how can these kind of win-win scenarios be developed. And critical about that is it is a process that involved all stakeholders. Uh, there are very, very important examples in the Danube region where this has been applied. Uh, an area just downstream of Vienna where I live where the improvements in navigation are actually funding the restoration of the national park, the river restoration activities. Because of the deepening of the riverbed is not good for navigation and it's not good for the national park because the floodplain forest is drying out. The measures proposed are ones that should achieve both. This process, I think, is one that is possible over a variety of sectors. We've initiated now a similar process, and now I'm not speaking for Marcus, but with the hydropower sector, the similar kind of dialogue. 
And if I could give one sort of plea at the end of this statement, it is that I think one of the critical things that has been needed, it is people from the water sector to make sure that the other sectors know you have a river basin management plan and to make them aware of that and to allow them to integrate it, as was said earlier in the integration discussion, into their thinking and their activities. This green uh, infrastructure will only happen if they have from our side, the water side, the uh, statement of what is important to us, what needs to be achieved. And I can say from the dialogue with the navigation sector that has been very positively received that information. And we have very good examples in countries such as Romania, which is represented here, um, Croatia, which is also here, and also non-EU member states such as Serbia, which are now doing those activities to integrate together. But the critical element was to go to them with the river basin management plans so that they can adjust their plans to what we need in terms of the water quality. I just have a very quick follow-up question. What kind of policies would promote this type of dialogues? This is what we're discussing now. Now the, uh, the policies uh, are the ones in place. As the river basin management plan exists, the, the critical thing I think is the point that uh, Mr. Holtzwatt made earlier is that the funding schemes at the EU level have to be uh, recognizing the river basin management plans have to be not con contradicting with those and quite frankly the biggest challenge that we had in the Danube region related to this was to ensure that DG Regio, DG Environment and DG Move were talking to one another. It's actually not such a major policy initiative needed, it's a simply a matter of establishing relationships between people who need to talk with one another. Very good, Alistair. Thank you. Um, well, it's quite strange for me to be here today, um, as uh, I don't normally work at this sort of uh, policy level, but um, at uh, an implementing level, trying to implement a lot of these policies on the ground. And I think that's quite interesting for you to hear some of the problems that we have. Um, I'd like to start off with a, um, a response, really, to some of uh, Xavier's comments about hydropower. And uh, I'd certainly like to add my voice to the, to the call for, for more knowledge in this area. And it's very interesting to hear that coming from the energy sector, because um, you know, despite a lack of knowledge, um, the development of hydropower across Europe um, progresses at an alarming rate. Um, and, uh, um, you know, the, the industry acknowledges this, as you've heard, and particularly the, the march of micro and mini hydropower um, with questionable sustainability. And we find that this permanently compromises our ability to deliver good ecological status on the ground. So we do need to find a way of properly assessing these projects. Um, and looking at the real cost benefits in terms of communities and society at large before um, continuing this. And of course, this is, this is uh, um, further um, uh, supported by the problems in bringing together the different policies of energy and carbon with those of water, which have already been mentioned uh, this morning. Uh, and we often find that, uh, that people talk about win-wins in terms of uh, navigation and um, hydropower. Often those, those win-wins are rarely that. They, they're, they're always compromises for the ecology. So we do need to invest more time in properly looking at um, the true ecosystem value of our natural processes in rivers. Um, and I would also like to say that this, this whole question of green infrastructure um, and being able to use green infrastructure to address hydromorphological morph um, modifications is not a simple one. It's not just a case of taking a bunch of green infrastructure projects and throwing them at a map of a river. Um, it's not a simple if issue, and if we don't do this correctly, at, w at best we will um, not deliver on our promises and waste a lot of money, but at worst we could actually add to flood and drought problems. Um, it, this requires technically competent people working on the ground in watersheds, um, engaged in um, accurate identification of key ecosystem processes, and those, those processes which do support society and economy, um, and the development of paid ecosystem services routes for actually funding um, landowners, uh, communities, local authorities to change their practice for the benefit of society at large. Thank you. Thank you. Irene. Thank you, David. Well, we've heard quite a bit about um, how to progress with ecosystem restoration, which of course is very important. But I would like to, to highlight another aspect, and that is to maintain the green infrastructure that we still have. 
And this is uh, why uh, we as, as WWF, but also together with other NGOs, we are promoting a strategic approach, for example, for hydropower planning, where we first map and assess those um, areas, those sections of the rivers and parts of, of the, the freshwater ecosystems that play an essential role for the overall system. For example, that are still supplying um, bed load um, for um, river sections and further down, um, maybe that, that host some endemic species um, um, where we have to really maintain this, this area. So, um, but also, of course, to, um, to take into consideration um, areas that are already highlighted um, for the ecological um, importance, such as high ecological um, status river stretches, but also um, freshwater Natura natu 2000 areas. So once we have mapped those areas that are really important for the overall system, for biodiversity, for ecosystem services, for, for maintaining or for achieving um, the objectives of the Water Framework Directive, then we can identify those areas where we think um, hydropower development should should not take place simply because the risk is too high. These are areas that are too precious um, to, to, uh, to put at risk. Um, this is, by the way, um, also a call that, that we already heard in May 2010 coming from the EU water directors. They called for the designation of no-go areas or exclusion zones. So we think that is very important, but of course, besides those no-go areas, we should also identify um, river sections that still deserve um, special um, protection even if they are not maybe completely uh, to be kept free of, of hydropower development. So this is um, something we believe is the only way really to, to, to cope with this pressure that is coming from development. It was just mentioned, especially from, from small and, hydro, uh, small and, and, and micro hydropower um, projects that are in the pipeline. It is simply impossible, we believe, for authorities to evaluate um, each of these projects individually. So by, by having this zonation in place, decisions will be, we be, will be um, become much easier um, and um, we, we will have a much higher chance to, to achieve the, the, the objectives that, that we have, um, that, that the Water Framework Directive has set. But of course also um, other um, other um, biodiversity policies of the European Union. That's, by the way, something that we are missing a bit in the, in the blueprint. This is to, to highlight um, also just the, um, the, the need um, for, for efficiency reasons to integrate better objectives of, of um, birds and habitats directive, but also of the, the EU biodiversity strategy. We just talked about um, restoration, flood burn restoration, river restoration. Um, that can really help us to, to um, come closer to the goal of, of restoring 15% um, of, of ecosystems. So why not, um, why not better integrate those objectives and of course also implementation plans. Um, about um, funding alignment, we are very happy to, to, to see that, that focus in the blueprint. Um, maybe just to highlight, this is not just about um, the, the direct payments, um, not about the, it, it's, it's uh, when you talk about the, the common agricultural policy, it's, it's both about the first and the second pillar, so how to spend direct payments, we believe that, that um, um, water framework di di uh, directive objectives need to be, become part of, of the cross compliance, but of course, as, as was already uh, men, um, pointed out, also sufficient funding um, from, from the, the second pillar. And maybe as a, as a last thought, um, we are glad that um, the, the, the lack of application or proper application of the Article 4.7 um, um, is, is mentioned in the blueprint. Um, we also believe that um, if with better application we, um, we would have much less problems. Um, but of course the, 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 the question is how to achieve that and th this is where we, we think the, 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 the blueprint leaves us with a, a big question mark. There is, um, it, it is mentioned that transparency is, um, is one way of, um, must be part of, of the solution. And just to give you an example, um, in, the, in the Danube Basin, I mean, first of all, we're also surprised about how little um, projects actually are, are, are being, um, are, are undergoing, are being announced and undergoing um, for, for Article 4.7 assessment. But even if they do, um, we, we don't have access to the information. So, I mean, how can we, um, how can we get an impression, um, what are the weaknesses of, of such a study of Article 4.7 assessment, but also how 
how can, can countries um, learn from each other, how to improve um, the, the, the application um, in, in order to, to, to make this article really um, work and, and do what it is supposed to do. And that is um, to in, in some um, very well-grounded cases to, to allow for, for an exception. Um, but um, many cases um, also just, just to, to, to show, to make clear that other options um, are there and then um, to, to promote um, this, this other path. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. We spent uh, quite a bit of time on the first question, but that's the largest question. I think in the interest of time, we will combine the last two questions because they're both on abstraction and ecological flow. So is implementing the notion of ecological flow to deal with the over-abstraction problem? And what about illegal abstraction? Maybe we start from the center and start with Alistair. Um, yes, just a quick uh, co few comments on ecological flows, and uh, it's um, uh, I think the notion of um, protecting ecological flows, you know, it's not not a particularly new one. We've been using hands-off flows and, and other terms for this for, for quite some time, um, but uh, referring to it in the blueprint and so on is very helpful. Um, but I'm concerned that that my understanding or an ecologist's understanding of environmental flows is different from those of decision makers and engineers. Um, they often just want to them, uh, me to give them a, a number uh, which th we can start to negotiate around. Um, our understanding of ecological flow requirement, uh, requirements limits our ability to properly set standards. Minimum flow is only part of the story for ecology. Um, ecology also needs high flows and they need proper timing of flow. And that changes with man-made infrastructure and natural variability. Um, ecological flows are often enshrined in inflexible political and legal agreements which will cause difficulties with the changing needs of society and ecology. Um, rivers, on the other hand, are dynamic, and we need dynamic management to reflect this. The setting of ecological flows now with water resources and their ecology already highly impacted reinforces the shifting baseline rather than aspiring to um, improve ecological status for future generations, which is critical to the implementation of European and international legislation and agreement on sustainability. And finally, the use of ecological flows often contradicts the biological understanding that we need to restore natural processes in our environment uh, for the long-term sustainability of natural resources, which impact fisheries, agriculture, flood and coastal management. So I think uh, it's great that we are seeing um, environmental flows being proposed quite widely, but we must remember that the use of this tool is a compromise and not a solution to facilitate, facilitate increased development. A question then to the other panelists as well is, is this a good compromise? I mean, we, we know we've all said that we don't know enough about ecological flows. So is this a compromise that needs to be made in order for action to happen immediately? So I give it to Irene. Well, I mean, the, the question is, what, what, what do, how do we identify action? I mean, it's clear that um, in, in order to, to really um, achieve ecological flow. We, we have to embark on a long process. I mean, the first step, of course, is um, the, the, to, to apply scientific knowledge, um, expertise to, to define um, what is the ecological flow at a certain um, location. But then, of course, we, we also need then to, to the countries need to identify um, how to, to actually implement that together with stakeholders. So also here, um, a, a, a thorough stakeholder involvement process is important. Also so that takes time. Then how to, to integrate it in, into um, the, 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 the current um, policy framework. Some countries, um, they, they have traditionally, historically given very long-term um, permits. So how to change, how to adjust that. So um, it's, it's clear that um, what is most important is to have the political will, um, to, to have a clear roadmap, and then to take it step by step. Um, the, the cross-border um, aspect is, is certainly also important here. That's maybe something that, that is um, sometimes forgotten. Also, that, of course, needs, needs time, needs space um, to, to, to negotiate ecological flows uh, across borders. Um, and, well, um, should I also now really talk about the, the over-abstraction? Like yeah. well, when I'm just talking because, um, yeah, over-abstraction um, was uh, an, another um, question to, to be discussed. Um, I'm afraid I have to, to uh, turn to, to the, the classic, classical example of Spain simply because the, the, the database here is quite good. I mean, just to, to um, remind the audience what we are talking about, about one-sixth of the irrigated 
area in Spain um, is actually irrigated with, with water without permits. Um, there are about half a million um, illegal wells in Spain. So this, this is a mind-boggling dimension, and also that it's clear that, that we cannot solve that um, overnight. Um, using, applying GMES is, is certainly a, a very important part of, of the solution, but without um, political will to, to then also um, um, enforce um, legislation um, and, and also come up, for example, um, with, 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 um, uh, uh, with a punishment system that, that really bites. Um, we will probably, I mean, the, just uh, having an increased knowledge about where illegal abstractions taking place is not enough. So also that um, is, a, um, is a comprehensive process and um, preferably should, should also be complemented with other uh, measures um, su such as a labeling system that um, shows consumers which products have been um, grown um, with water um, where um, a, a proper um, permit was in place. Um, we in, in Europe, we have a, a growing awareness um, among our consumers, so let's, let's also give consumers the choice and, and give the, the, the right incentives. Thank you. Thank you, Irina. Phil? Huh? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, these, the issue of um, ecological flow, as I think has been said earlier, is a political process. It's not a, um, one that involves the necessity of having people dialogue together. But there is the, the first step in that that is needed is the water balance, understanding the system. And I think the uh, hydropower um, presentation you heard earlier indicated that there is research needed. Uh, quite frankly, I was a little bit shocked at how many river basins didn't have adequate monitoring systems in place. Without an adequate monitoring system, you can't okay. begin to do this work, and there seems to be some necessary groundwork that needs to happen on a variety of different river basins and, and in different circumstances. And the uh, monitoring of the system, getting a water balance is absolutely critical to being able to take the next step, which I, I agree is a a political decision, but I would certainly advocate that from the water side, we need to define what is ecologically possible and able to be done within some sort of degrees of, of magnitude in order to decisions to be made by other actors. The important thing here is that the hydropower sector needs this water balance. Uh, it also needs this information. The navigation sector needs it the same way. Uh, we have a combined interest, I think, in making sure that this research and this information is available, and we have an interest in coming together to determine how the allocations and the uh, mechanisms of deciding how the flows are to be um, utilized uh, can be, be undertaken. This uh, is a process that has to be combined, certainly, my own sense, from the issue of sediments. We, the issue of sediment management is also one that is, again, affecting um, hydropower, it's also an important part of the ecological processes. And these two issues are areas where there seems to be a great deal of, of uh, groundwork that needs to be done that can allow these uh, decision-making processes on ecological flow to, to take place. But the implementing of the notion seems a positive step, and I think the blueprint advocating for that is, is a good thing. Uh, whether it solves the over-abstraction problem or not, I, I can't say, but it certainly will be a step in the right direction. And as far as the last uh, issue of to tackle illegal abstractions, if it's illegal, it shouldn't happen, period. That's, uh, there's not much to discuss, I think, about that. Uh, and uh, to make sure that it uh, actually, uh, the enforcement takes place. Yeah, maybe a short word about ecological flow. Of course, it's a, an important issue, a good, uh, very important question. Um, it has been said in many regulations of many countries in Europe, it's an arbitrary number. If we decide in this river we, we need to, to, to have a X a cubic meter per second and it's the ecological flow. Of course, it's not relevant. Of course, it doesn't correspond to the needs of ecosystems. And of course, it doesn't come from a scientific approach and a multi-stakeholder approach. So we first need to have the scientific and multi-stakeholder approach to, to appreciate 
what is the ecological flow and it has to do with uh, water management. Of course, it can't be a single number. Uh, it depends on the season, it depends on the ecosystem needs. So it's not a single number, it's, it's something to be integrated in water management. I'm convinced about that. And I think it could be connected with an initiative we took last year. We took the initiative to elaborate what, what we call at this time, it's not maybe the correct name, the water footprint of uh, electricity generation and we take the initiative to elaborate a water footprint for electricity generation and to to measure and manage it and it won't be a single number also so we're not interested in knowing how many how much water we use we know that <laughs> and so it's not a question of volume but it's a question of uh, knowing uh, what is the impact of electricity generation uh, on water quality uh, it's knowing uh, the impact on scarcity. It's not the same to store water when you have water and to release it when we are, you are in a, in a scarcity period than to do the, the reverse. Uh, so we, we want to build a water footprint which would be relevant regarding uh, seasonal uh, arrival of water and uh, quality of water. And I think uh, 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 an approach of ecological flow could be connected with this water footprint approach, uh, would, could lead in uh, indicators and means to approach the question of uh, flow release uh, in, for the ecosystem in river uh, basin management plans. Thank you. I think it's time now to open it up to the floor for discussion. You've heard from our, our panel members. So we'll start a discussion about a 40 minutes discussion from the floor. Please, when you ask a question or make a statement, please state your name and the where you are from. And uh, try to concentrate on the question of, are the policy measures in the water blueprint enough? Are they a step in the right direction? Or what else needs to be added to the blueprint? Thank you. Hello, my name is Michael Bender. I'm from uh, German NGO Grüne Liga and also today here for Environmental um, Bureau. And uh, I will uh, first make a general comment on the blueprint. Uh, environmental NGOs are uh, very much welcoming the findings of the blueprint in general. And uh, we also identified the uh, issue of the policy coherence as one of the major obstacles for uh, WFD implementation and this of course is a common task of the European Commission, the European Parliament and the Member States as the voice of the Member States is heard in the Council decisions. Um, and I want to make a more concrete comment on the first question and that is of course we have to make sure that natural water retention measures like buffer strips, wetlands, restored floodplains must be included in the ecological focus areas in Cup Pillar 1. And not only in Pillar 2, so if we only include it in Pillar 2, then we end up with a few positive pilot projects, whereas the whole situation as a, is, does not improve or is even deteriorating. So, in times of budgetary pressures, we need to ensure that public money supports public goods. Thank you. Thank you very much for the comment. So, cap pillar one and two should be included, not one or the other. Further questions or comments? David. Hi, uh, David Zetlin from Wageningen University. Um, I'm sorry that the Spanish representative has left us, uh, but perhaps, uh, I don't know, Marta or someone else can explain this to me. And I'm going to say Spain uh, as a representative country because we have statistics with Spain, but I, we know that this is the over abstraction is happening in other countries. But I'm quite curious about why uh, the Spanish government, the regional governments are so good at, at tracking subsidies uh, in terms of receiving income, but so bad at tracking water consumption. And I'm wondering if the departments of accounting can maybe switch staff to, uh, to, 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 to reconcile this uh, discrepancy. And, and, and more pointedly, I'm wondering, uh, and I brought this up to other people before, um, you know, this, there's a subsidiarity question, and this conference is probably going to be balancing on that question quite a bit. 
But if, if Spain won't, and I'm using Spain again as a representative country, there are other countries. If Spain won't uh, meet their obligations under the Water Framework Directive, uh, is that the EU's uh, obligation to step in and, and essentially do manage Spain's business? And if that's so, is it possible to link the money that Spain and Spanish farmers are getting from the cap to uh, meeting the obligations of sustainable water management? I know this is a political question, but this is a political conference, right? So when is this going to happen? And if we have the third and fourth of these meetings and it never happens and it never happens because Spain doesn't have enough money, I'm, I'm not quite sure if this is ever going to get resolved. So how, how do we go about this? Thank you. I think that's a good question for us to ponder. And that's one of the, one of the questions that's being considered with the CAP 1 and CAP 2 proposals of the integration. So let's, we can consider that for a while too. Please. Mm, thank you, Jozef Goya from Global Water Partnership Hungary. I would like to refer to, to Phil's comment that uh, uh, no illegal connection, Ill illegal water abstraction uh, should be made, or or, or simply uh, banning illegal water abstraction. It is it is a bit more complicated problem uh, because very often people. Uh, create illegal wells not because they simply want to steal water, but because of over complicated uh, legislation and and uh, uh, issuing the permits are are usually uh, not not so simple. Also because of of uh, non awareness of of the of the harm they they create. So I think that the uh, uh, what is written in the blueprint about uh, about. Uh, water accounts and also education awareness raising can help to solve this problem. There are many, many facets of, of this problem that I want to, uh, to point out. Thank you. Any response, Phil? Yeah, I think there is, uh, I stand by what I said earlier. If it's illegal, it's illegal. And uh, there has to be a mechanism to um, yeah, ensure that what is illegal is, is simply not done, period. Regardless of whatever the reasons behind it, it may be that programs need to be developed to, to support uh, ensuring that that's the, the case, but the uh, acknowledgement that it is illegal should be uh, the first, I would say, to step in that process. Okay, we have two questions in the back, farther back there, yep, yep, please. Um, I'm Conchita Marcuello from FedEx, Spain, and I'm sorry to be here, maybe. Um, <laughs> I have no political position here because I don't think it's a, the political issue is on Wednesday, I think, where water directors meet. But I can tell something about this statement in the, in the communication from the Commission. It, uh, it was quite surprising because I think that Spain is not the only problem in the blueprint, apart from not having reported the plans, but it's uh, the question of uh, the problems of the water planning are much more in Europe, rather than illegal abstraction of Spain. Uh, and as the Global Water, water Partnership said, uh, the question of the those, uh, wells is a question of legal enforcement and uh, to have a legal uh, probably uh, to have the uh, legal uh, points uh, on the table i mean uh, there are some uh, uh, permits that have to be e issued i think in the right time so it's i think more, more, much more a question of enforcement and uh, taking a streamlined with all the legal provisions for water abstractions and I would very welcome to uh, discuss in this over abstraction problems the question of metering and enforcement of metering in other basins and enforcement of metering in, in other water issues, uses, agricultural and uh, urban water as well. So um, this is my point. Just one minute. Does anybody want to respond on the issue of over abstraction? Anybody from the panel want to respond on the over abstraction issue and whether the uh, monitoring mechanism that's been proposed is enough? I think on a legal abstraction, 
if, if we all consider that this is one of the problems that we have to tackle, perhaps, let's say, we need to see how we tackle, because it's very easy to say, well, it shouldn't exist, and that's it. But perhaps it's good to, to know why, in certain areas, it has arrived a situation that illegal extraction is spread out, why this has happened, which are the mechanisms behind this, and then try to solve the problem analyzing this. Because in many situations, this illegal extraction is not overnight. I mean, this is practices that have been happening for decades in some areas. So, very spread out, decades, normally it's areas where you have, let's say, social problems, let's call this way. So, um, let's analyze all the, prep, all the problems behind this. Areas that, in some cases, there is cap funds, but in some areas there are not cap funds behind this. So I think analyzing this, we will be able to provide some solutions. Because normally in areas where there is illegal extraction, it's not that easy to change this tendency from one day to another. We should change this tendency. So it's important that we analyze why we arrived to this and which are the mechanisms that could be put in place in order to account the EU's nature directives and the EU's biodiversity strategy because if we don't see integration on that also for what concerns restoration of ecosystems and, and, uh, and a push also from the Commission through other policies then it will be very difficult to meet the objectives of these directives as well. Um, a small point on uh, water abstraction and political will. Uh, political will um, comes very difficulty on issues that are well established and have been the best practice for a very long time, or the bad practice, if you wish. So I think the, the European Commission has a very clear role there in, uh, in actually pushing member states to uh, put the practice and enforce the, direct, the directive like they should. And it's not just a case of discussing and analysing. Some, at some point we have to uh, stop analyzing and just make sure we enforce uh, the law. Um, another point is that uh, also clear from the panel today, uh, the, like the Water Framework Directive, also the blueprint seems to take and to discuss a lot more about countries that have big river systems, lots of water, and uh, looks less at countries like Cyprus, for example, that has uh, water systems that are often seasonal. Uh, we don't have hydropower, we don't have navigation, but we do have many ecosystems that depend on water, and these are often starved from water because practically all the rivers have been dammed in Cyprus and there's uh, very little water ending up in the sea. So I think these are elements that also have to be looked at from a European perspective because they are true problems that, uh, that countries in the south uh, and drought area countries have to face. And finally, uh, for what concerns the, the ecological flow, yes, uh, it's important to know more. And I absolutely agree with the, uh, with the gentleman from the Rivers uh, Trust that we have to know when to let the ecological flow, the timing is important, the ecological conditions are important. But at the same time, we should not use the fact that we don't know everything to postpone action forever on this thing because there are ecosystems that really need this water and we have to take the action to let the water through. Thank you. Thank you. I have a line up of four more questions. Somebody from the middle on, the, on this side was, no? No more? Okay, then up here on the front. 
Thank you. Uh, Sergei Moroz is my name. I'm also from WWF. And uh, just a quick comment and uh, a, a, a question to the panel. Um, the comment, and this is referring to the legal abstraction that we were talking about, and I understand it's complicated, but things really need to be done. And one of the particular tools at our disposal is common agricultural policy reform that is being discussed at the moment. And one of the very clear recommendations, one of the clear tools there is including some of the provisions like having a permit to abstract water legally into the cross-compliance regime. This is exactly what it is designed for, and that's one of the mechanisms that can help enforce um, and, and solve some of the enforceability, together with other measures as well. But it can be a very useful mechanism as well, including this in the cross-compliance. And then um, the, 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 the pressure that we are getting, uh, um, the, the discussion level of discussion in the Council and in the Parliament, for example, on this, are uh, worrying, so sort of also to sound uh, the earlier discussion we had in the first panel. So it's really not clear. We have a very clear tool that can help, uh, but the decision makers are really not um, agreeing to take it forward. Thank you. Okay, in the back, over here, far the back. Yes, me? Yeah. Uh, my name is Jeremy Biggs. I'm from the NGO Pond Conservation. I'm also here from the European Environmental Bureau. Uh, I would like to raise one general policy issue, which is that of small waters. Small waters, by which I mean headwaters, small streams, small lakes, less than 50 hectares, uh, ditch systems, and the millions of ponds across the continent are largely uh, ignored in the directive at the moment in water policy, yet they are fundamental. As you can read the European Environment Agency's report, there's a, there's a box on page 66 of their report. They are fundamental for freshwater biodiversity, and we know there's a crisis in freshwater biodiversity, and they're also fundamental for ecosystem services. So I'd like to suggest that we need to look at the directive and the blueprint in that context, ways of improving the policy for small waters, the policy, to answer your question, the policy measures are not yet good enough for that. I'd suggest we need some guidance on how best to, to tackle small waters, which would operate at the European level. And this is very interestingly appropriate just to the Cyprus comment we had a moment ago. Many of the Mediterranean countries also have a lot of small waters which are very important for biodiversity, which are not well considered in the directive. And we also need, in policy terms, some demonstration measures of what works to protect these waters, because our knowledge of the effectiveness of measures generally, uh, all measures, is really rather poor at the moment. And research, I think many of you would be shocked by the lack of research evidence of measures which we're talking about in this room as effective. Those research data are far weaker than you might imagine. That's true for small waters, but for many others too. Um, and I'd also echo, with respect to small waters, the need to integrate Water Framework Directive Policy and Habitats Directive Policy. At present, biodiversity policy and water policy often are not well integrated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very good suggestions. I had a question in the front in the right here. Somebody? Yeah. <coughs> yes, thanks. Hello. Uh, Beata Werner from the European Environment Agency, and uh, thanks uh, to, the, to the colleague just speaking. Um, Yes, I, I would like to ask a little bit being short on the ecological flows because this is really one very central part uh, in terms of f focusing on an ecological target in a wider sense. In Close to that, I think it is not only about uh, the ecological flow, the minimum flow, the volume, it is about the whole flow regime. So I haven't heard the word flow regime. And when we are talking about flow regime, we are close to green infrastructure and the uh, respective measures as well. Now I'm wondering, as, as question now to the, ta uh, to the audience, um, how can we make sure that this flow regime is really in sense of a good ecological status uh, covered uh, in our further implementation of the Water Framework Directive and uh, um, uh, following the blueprint. Uh, because I think this, this ecological target is absolutely important, but we need to take care what is the uh, uh, regional 
difference and the speci uh, specialities uh, in the ecoregions, uh, do we maybe need some kind of, of intercalibration process? There's still a lot of science to be done as well. Um, how can we tackle that from your perspective as a river trust or uh, as an NGO having experience in the Danube or with some of that rivers? Thank you. And it's very important, by the way, for our session four, because this is exactly the target we need for the allocation. Thanks. Um, I'll respond a little bit, although I'm not sure if I can help on the scale of the Danube. Um, the, uh, um, I th hope when I was um, answering the question initially why, by talking about timing of flows and size of flows and so on, that I was sort of talking about flow regimes. Um, but, uh, and the other things we have to consider, of course, is with, with hydrological flow, there's also geomorphological flow and bed load movement and so on. What, what I'm really concerned about is constructing some kind of um, equation for the engineers that says, at this period in the month, we need X amount of flow and so on and so on. So we start creating these artificial flow regimes that very quickly become detached from the actual ecological um, signal that we're trying to, or the ecological result that we're trying to produce. How we get to that point, I don't know. Um, it's, it's very difficult to see how green infrastructure can tackle some of the really big uh, dam issues that we have, which you know, completely obstruct a, a river or waterway, um, because you're, you're always going to be disconnecting that bed lewd movement uh, and so on. So I don't have the answers, I'm afraid, but um, I do understand the issue. So. I think maybe... Maybe just just a short comment. I think we have uh, also a question of uh, scientific approach, and we we, we need uh, more investigation in the scientific field to understand what's going on. But we also need uh, to integrate it in in water management, but not only in in books and so on. We need to integrate it in water management and in the in the dialogue between the, the stakeholder of the in around the river. And especially, I, I would say, between the, the people from hydropower or navigation and so on, and the people from the, the ONG or the people who know the river and who know the, the operational ecological status of the river at this moment. And in this dialogue, which can be at a, a, a daily or weekly or monthly frequency, I don't know, we can speak and exchange views and adapt our management to the ecological flow of the river. And I think it's more accurate to say, next month we need a little bit more, or next month we need a little bit less, less because it's important for the, the ecological system, that to say, in January, every year, you put 10 cubic meters a second in the river. It doesn't mean anything. That's what I meant. Okay, please. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, my name is Gunnar Norén. I'm coming from the coalition Clean Baltic, a network of 22 environmental NGOs in the Baltic catchment. I would like to address this with the green infrastructure and something about the eutrophication of water. When it comes to green infrastructure, I think this discussion is important. Of course, wetlands and this can, can in the agricultural landscape work as nutrient traps also when it comes to reduction of nutrients. But we also have to see that we have contradicting policies here. I know in the Baltic Sea region, for example, uh, on the national level, you give subsidies then to reconstruction of wetlands, but you also give subsidies for ditching of wetlands. So we have to deal with this first, you know, before we can really find a, a good green in infrastructure. Uh, on the other component on eutrophication solutions for waters and rivers and Baltic Sea, where I come from, where it's one of the key uh, problems. And there we have then 50% of the load of the nutrient comes from the agricultural sector. So all this with solving a part of this again, I would just like to stress on, it must be solved then in connection also with the, with the cap subsidies and, and the cross compliance. So we must require a nutrient balanced fertilization. We can have limit then for the uh, nutrient surplus. And we have one country in the Baltic Sea region in Germany that put up limit for this 50 to 60 kilo nitrogen per hectare and year. So that's the best practice. And uh, voluntary measures have so far not been working. So we need uh, to uh, work on, on the cab subsidies because that will steer the farmer's behavior. 
And again, then I just repeat and say public money for public goods, and we have to take it that way. Thank you. Andrew, please. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm Andrew Farmer from the Institute for European Environmental Policy. Um, I just want to comment on the use of ecological flows. Um, and I fully agree with the complexity that Alistair um, outlined. But I just want to make a plea that we don't make the best the enemy of the good. Um, that um, in many river basins in Europe, there is very little information about um, inputs and outputs to basins of, of flow um, of water uses. And what we need to do is start with a basic understanding of what um, the ecology of rivers, um, how they're dependent on flows. Now that may be um, in a very limited way, but it begins the link between quantitative water understanding and biological response and begins that understanding with the concept of ecological status. And it also provides a good link with um, the objectives of the habitat directive and protection of sites and species under that directive. As information improves, then we can become more um, intelligent in understanding all different aspects of the flow regime. But we need to be uh, careful, as um, the blueprint talks about developing guidance um, as uh, the response on ecological flows, that that guidance allows those, those river basins which have a lot of information to take that forward and use that intelligently to make good decisions on ecological objectives and water users. And those which are starting with very little information to make the first steps and begin that process. So moving all the different basins forward um, from the position that they're in at the moment. Um, so that I, I just make a plea um, that we, you know, move forward from the bases that we are at. Okay, we have one response from the panel, Alistair. Andrew, I do, I do agree, and I hope that my uh, comments weren't uh, um, sort of negative towards using environmental flows within the, within the blueprint, which I think is a really important step forward. Um, and I do think that uh, Xavier's comments on adaptive management are absolutely key. The, the problem that I see is um, how do we um, um, integrate adaptive management in the kind of legal documents that always go with, with protecting environmental flows. You know, suddenly you have something that's fixed that you can't then adapt. Uh, and that, I think, is the real challenge, is, is you know, how we break through that barrier, because adaptive management is the key. OK, question back. Conchita Marcuello, CEDEX. Uh, I, have, um, I welcome the uh, issue on sediments that you've made uh, before, the EDF, I think. Or, uh, well, uh, because it's not a minor problem, in space, especially when there are uh, high regulated, highly regulated rivers in a territory. And I think that it is an issue of how this, the alteration of the sediment regime affects the uh, hydromorphology of uh, rivers. And I would like to uh, make a point on the role that uh, the GMES could play on following sedimentation apart from following other issues such as legal abstractions and so on and so on. And I think that the um, EAs in the communication is quite skewed in this, um, in this way of, of following abstractions when it's good, a good potential for following eutrophication in reservoirs, eutrophication in rivers, water quality. And also we could have an effort to follow um, the monitoring of sediments and uh, and also to enhance the capabilities of GMES in data as a data provider for the water framework directive implementation. Great, thank you for that. We'll take one or two more questions for those of you who have been watching the clock. We started about 15 or 20 minutes late, so we will go another 15. Or, well, we'll go 15 or 20 minutes, which will take us only about. Um, 10 more minutes we have. So we'll take a few more questions and then I just warn the panel that I will give them one minute to conclude at the end, just to give their impression, a little bit of feedback on does this water blueprint now take, it, take us far enough based on what you've heard and what final recommendations would you give? So that will be the last 
few minutes of this session. So, quest more questions from the audience? Thank you. Mark Owen from the European Anglers Alliance. Um, everyone uh, on the panel and everyone in the room seems to agree that uh, far more research is needed on ecological flows um, and very much welcome that this is emphasised in the blueprint. Um, that research is going to take some time to, um, uh, uh, to come to conclusions. Um, how does the panel feel we should deal with the present uh, applications of hydropower uh, that are in the system? Um, and the logical conclusion of the fact that we need far more research on the impacts, does that imply that uh, there should be a moratorium on any more applications? Thank you. <coughs> Xavier? I'm not sure to, to get exactly your question, but <clears throat> I think we, yes, we need more, in, more monitoring about uh, uh, big valleys in which we have big hydropower schemes. And uh, our impression is that uh, regarding hydro schemes, uh, we already have a number of solutions to better integrate hydro streams in water management plans and that this is the important part of the solution and that in this field hydro schemes could play a greener role, a greener role in what they bring to the ecosystem and to the water management of the basin in which they are. That is the point. And for the preceding remark about sediment transportation, Personally, I think that this is the biggest issue that hydropower has to address in the years to come. This is the biggest issue because, in fact, this is the, the biggest trouble that hydropower brings to a river. It's the problem of sediment transportation. And we already have a number of solutions, uh, especially regarding water management and structural modification of the schemes that can bring a solution to sediment transportation. And I think this, this issue is really the issue on which hydropower company have to stress upon during the year to come. Well, I mean, ideally, um, we, we would have a moratorium and then very quickly, um, really a, a pre-planning mechanism and agreement on place on, on, on how, how to make um, hydropower development sustainable. But of course, um, this is uh, most likely um, not implementable. So um, all the more important to, to come up with um, a pre-planning mechanism. Um, that is based on available uh, knowledge and, and data, um, and that is possible. I mean, we as WWF, we, we have already um, proposed a, um, a zonation approach, um, also with criteria um, uh, that, that include parameters for which we already have the data. Um, and um, by that, already very quickly inform hydropower developers um, where it, it will be um, comparatively easy if legislation um, is, is being applied to, to, to develop and where it will be um, difficult, very difficult to impossible. So that's something we believe could be um, done very quickly. It doesn't have to be cast in stone. It, it can be um, a, a first um, solution. That, that makes sure that the most valuable river stretches are protected and then in the next step um, to, do, to come up with a more fine-grained um, uh, methodology that could also then be, again, um, have some, some regional or, or national variations. But um, if, if that is the will, um, we believe that then um, we, we could ensure that the most precious river stretches will, will really um, be um, be protected um, and then of course um, in parallel also work on, on, um, on guidance on um, how to uh, implement projects sustainably um, at a project level so best available technology and so on. Okay we had one more comment from Fritz Holtart. Sometimes I have the feeling listening uh, to this debate uh, we are back 10 years ago, uh, frankly speaking. Uh, this is, uh, uh, and from my point of view, especially if it, uh, if it comes to hydropower, uh, I think uh, there was a lot of progress. Uh, if you see the dialogues which had been uh, installed uh, on the EU level, but also in the framework of the Alpine Convention, uh, for example, there are 
there are issues they had been taboo 10 years ago. If you want 10 years ago to talk with, uh, with hydropower companies about hydro peaking, this was a kind of no-go area for discussion because this had been the cash cow uh, for, for the companies. So also in this area, there is some movement. There, are, there, are, there is the possibility to discuss because there are technical solutions possible, there are management solutions possible, uh, and others. River continuity, okay, it's not sufficient, and the only thing what we are going to discuss is the, uh, the upstream continuity, and there is a lot of, there are a lot of gaps uh, if it comes to downstream uh, continuity. And uh, from my point of view, uh, if it comes to ecological flow, uh, I think it is a really major step that ecological flow is mentioned in the blueprint. But the, and the ch real challenge is not to make a guidance on ecological flow. The real challenge at the moment is how do we respond to, uh, to uh, concessions? They have to be renewed all over Europe where we need to, uh, to negotiate on ecological flows, where there is a very practical need to do things. And I think there is also a possibility to learn from our neighbors in Switzerland. They have, uh, they have an ecological flow uh, guideline where we can learn from and where we can see how we, how we can, uh, how we can uh, deal with it. But we have to be also clear that ecological flow is on one hand side has an ecological dimension, but on the other hand side it has an economic dimension. This means, uh, and I know that from, uh, from concession negotiations in the Upper Rhine Valley, uh, where we discussed ecological flow between 40 and 100 cubic meter per second uh, at a certain point. And where we had to see how we can really ensure in a practical way that we get a consensus between the ecological requirement and the economic requirement. So I really think if we are talking back to the to this morning about integration, about the issue that we have to see both sides of the coin. I think then it is really important also to accept that within the last 10 years, things changed and there is a difference. It is, it is not enough, but we should be, we should be really uh, uh, accepting that the Water Framework Directive changed, especially in hydropower. Things we would not have accepted 10 years ago to change. Good. I can take only a few very brief comments, so if you have a brief comment to make, please keep your within 30 seconds. <laughs> Start here and go to the side. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Sir Gamer was again. Just two very brief ones. One on the hydropower debate, one on e-flows. I, I think I would recognize the progress that has been made, um, and Fritz is right there, but we're also facing a massive challenge where in the next five years, a number of new hydropower projects that are being planned on some of the last remaining natural stretches in the river uh, in, in Europe is absolutely staggering. And we look at the Commission's analysis of Article 4.7, application, which is not happening. We've heard from Irene some of the ideas about pre-planning. We have only very few examples where this is uh, being done. Uh, so we definitely still face a lot of challenges, especially in the next period of time. You know, we don't have another 10 years. A lot of these rivers are at risk. And uh, if we are just going ahead without proper considerations, without proper strategic planning, a lot of damage can still be done. So I think it's really important that we are not complaining 
complacent. There is, there is something we need to solve. And I think the blueprint is really not giving us enough tools. That's one of the weaknesses of this. And very, very briefly on eFlows, also to support that, I think it's extremely important that we are looking at eFlows in the next uh, phase of the common implementation strategy. There is such a different understanding among the member states that actually getting that understanding on the table, having a debate about it, will be extremely useful. And we need to look at Switzerland, but I would also think that we need to look at the outside of Europe as well. The rest of the world has moved on very far on environmental and ecological flows, and I think there are very good examples from other parts of the world as well. So it's really to support, uh, it's really important that we look into that. Thanks. <coughs> My so, name is Sindri Langos. I'm working for the Federation of Swedish Farmers, but also representing Baltic Farmers Forum on Environment, 15 farmer organizations around the Baltic Sea, but also representing Copa Cochega. Uh, I would like to take up the first question here on, on the screen on the take up of green infrastructure, in particular restoration of wetlands and, uh, and floodplains, uh, which of course is, is uh, an issue that is directly impacting upon and pointing at, at, uh, at farmers and, and landowners. And um, in Sweden, I mean, this, this is a, a, an agro-environment measure offered in, in, the, in the second pillar of CAP. Uh, but the attractiveness of, 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 of this is maybe not the highest one, because <laughs> what governs the compensation given to farmers is uh, cost incurred and the income foregone. And, uh, what we've been explained is that this is due to, to WTO rules that prevents, I mean, countries or EU to, to actually pay farmers uh, more than, than cost uh, incurred and income foregone. And uh, we all know that, uh, that the recreation, for instance, of wetlands might be very, very valuable if they are being targeted very nicely far downstream uh, along the river systems. But currently, I mean, it's the same compensation, whether it's far up and, and not giving much value uh, ecologically or to society, or whether it's put very far downstream may give a lot of value. So my question would be, I mean, how is, is the EU pushing towards the World Trade Organization to, to actually get, get a new view upon this? Because if you take, I mean, land from <coughs> agricultural production and make it into something different, I mean, a societal ecosystem service, you are not actually you are you are taking land out of production and you're not producing agricultural products. So, how how can this come? It's not being I mean taken out of this this WTO rules and and uh, allowing I mean more targeted uh, uh, compensation to farmers. I mean trying to value I mean some uh, restore wetlands as more valuable than others. Yes, thank you. It's um, Michael Bender again. Um, one short comment is about this um, hydropower. I, I think uh, there's something still lacking, and this is a full assessment of Article 47 of in all new hydropower developments. And I think it's not happening at many uh, projects around Europe. Second, uh, when it comes to over-abstraction, please don't forget about the energy sector. I saw it, it's in the blueprint, but also don't forget about the mining activities. They sometimes have a very big uh, impact on whole river basins. Thank you. Okay, I think we cut the discussion off there. Thank you, everyone, for a very good discussion from the room. And now we turn it back over to the panel for some concluding remarks. Okay, thank you. So one minute. Huh? <laughs> yeah, for me, thank you very much. It was uh, it was very pleased to be there. It was a very interesting discussion. Uh, I would say uh, stress upon three points. First, I think that coming from the river basin management plans, uh, we already have a number of solutions that work. As it has been said, for example, for hydropower, hydropower man, hydropower company doesn't work and doesn't react like 10 or 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, we have solution in our package, and I think that we have to look for these 10 or 15 year experiment and to put on the table the solution that work. I think it would be more very concrete, and maybe after the blueprint, a, a job could be done in that way to put on the table the solution that work. Secondly, uh, as we, is, it is a quite complicated question. Uh, I said that there's a lack of knowledge, a lack of R&D, that we need R&D and experiment, and I think that it's a good idea to put also on the table 
uh, experiments, uh, River Basin, where multi-stakeholder multi management, multi-stakeholder approach of the question could be done between regulators, operators, ONG, and so on, to uh, uh, progress in the field and put the scientific research into application in the River Basin experiment. This is the second point. And the third point, it won't be a surprise, is that I think that we must go further in the integration question, especially in between the CAP, energy policies and water policies. Between, because I think that at this time, we, we, don't, we didn't go any further. Yeah, as I said at the outset, I'm here representing Marcus Simona, who's from the navigation sector, and I'll try to think of what he would say. I think the... The main thing is that the navigation sector needs the blueprint, it needs river basin management plans to be able to respond to the goals that are there from an ecological or water quality perspective. And certainly our own experience in the Danube River Basin has shown that the navigation sector is willing to undertake green engineering on the basis of what the needs of the river system are and to undertake innovation in green infrastructure, redesigning ships or redesign ships that they can uh, utilize rivers as natural systems. And that, uh, I think, is an indication that if the kind of uh, multi-sectoral dialogue that has been talked about happens, we can achieve uh, the goal here. And I certainly would advocate for undertaking that dialogue, but most important from the water sector, to make sure that the other sectors are aware of the river basin management plans, what the needs are from a water perspective. Thank you. Uh, I have two uh, concluding remarks to make. Um, the first one is to j join with others, really, and say, you know, river basin management plans or catchment management plans that, that don't incorporate energy, carbon, floods, agriculture, and so on are severely limited and even detach 90% of the public interest from river management. Um, uh, we could do all the uh, green infrastructure work we want, uh, but we would not deliver good ecological status without tackling those elephants in the river. Uh, and that in includes incorporating hydropower into catchment management. Um, the other comment I'd like to make is about CAP 1 and 2 and, uh, and, and where things go. Um, and I think it's very policy or legislative level to say we'll put it in cross-compliance and enforce it. But working on the ground, we see very little activity in enforcement. And as someone involved in upland farming myself, um, the only person that knows that goes on, on on my bit of farmland is me. Um, and, um, you know, the, that would go for the vast majority of farmers. I think the consequences of putting things into cross-compliance is that, firstly, you prevent NGOs who are doing a lot of work in this sector from delivering this kind of work because suddenly it's a statutory requirement or something that people are required to do. Um, it also disenfranchises landowners and farmers who are suddenly required to do something that they weren't required to do before and they don't understand why. And it also leads to a broad approach that actually, you know, we've heard that these green infrastructure need to be targeted very accurately to, to, to produce the outcomes we want. Um, and by taking this broad approach that all farmers must comply with this, that or the other, means you, you don't get that targeting that you need for green infrastructure to work. Thank you. Um, I would like to highlight two issues. One is communication and the other um, is um, strategic planning, integrated strategic planning, but before doing that, I also would like to, to mention that we are very glad about this um, global dimension um, um, section in the blueprint. We think that so far this has been a, um, a missing element. We are very glad that it is now being, being highlighted and emphasized. Um, but now coming back to, to the two other issues I would, would like to, to focus on in my concluding remarks. The one is an integrated um, strategic approach that, that we need actually for, for um, several issues. I mean, hydropower, um, I already mentioned, it was discussed, but also um, floodplain, wetland restoration, so that we know where the, the, the biggest potentials with the, the, the highest benefits for flood protection, for um, um, drought protection, um, for, for biodiversity conservation are, in order then to, to focus um, attention and funding on, on those priorities. Um, and um, then as a, as a second um, issue, 
that is um, communication. Um, in a way, I believe that, that one reason why quite often water and especially the, 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 the biodiversity um, element um, of, of um, water management question um, is losing out is that the, the water sector is not good enough at communicating also the, the, the economic um, benefits and the values for society um, of applying the ecosystem-based approach um, the, the Water Framework Directive is, is based on. If we did that better, um, I'm pretty sure that, that um, it was, was easier to, to come up with a, um, with, with a, with a fairer share of, of um, the, the, the water resource um, when, for example, negotiating with, with agriculture or the, the, the energy sector. And um, as a sort of um, internal communication within the, the environmental sector, I mean, I know that from my own organization, it's not always easy um, when, when you come from the, the, the biodiversity department um, to, uh, to come to, to a conclusion with the colleagues working on, on climate change issues, for example. Um, so this, this is, um, I guess, an issue that, that we could, could all um, also work on in our own organizations or in the, the own community communities we are working on, just to, to be better at, at um, communicating and, and, and um, also um, just um, joining, uh, joining forces and, and working together on, on the challenges ahead. Thank you. Now I take my position as the moderator to kind of sum up the session. I heard several things in this session and we had a very good discussion. We had a very good panelist discussion. They, I'm going to divide my comments into three categories from what I heard. I heard that we need more knowledge. And this, is, this has come out quite clearly in every, what everybody is talking about. There is knowledge on accounting. Even know how to account for all the water that's in the basin and when and where it is and in what quality it is. We need more knowledge on ecological flows. What does that mean? What do, eco, what do ecosystems need? What kind of flow regimes do they need? We need more knowledge about the impacts of policies. How are these policy suggestions that we're recommending, how do they really impact the system? Are there cases that we can study that show us? We need knowledge sharing. What are the tools, methods that have been used in areas that work under different types of systems? And how can we share those processes? Stakeholder, stakeholder processes are one way of knowledge sharing, but we need knowledge sharing between basins as well. Uh, the second, Main category is cross-compliance. This is something that came out quite clearly. This is something that's relatively new, I think, to the, the blueprint. But uh, we need cross-compliance cross across policies within the EU. We need a harmonization of the policies within the EU with the habitat direction, the common agricultural policy, and energy policies. So we need cross-compliance with all the different policies that we have already on the table. And finally, the question of implementation and enforcement. Well, we have, we have some policies already under the Water Framework Directive. We're proposing more now with the Water Blueprint, but there needs to be some measure of enforcement. Monitoring is one, perhaps GMEs have been suggested. But these three, the knowledge, cross-compliance, and implementation are are the main topics that I got out of this session, and I thank you. These are focus areas. They may not, they may not be uh, direct policy recommendations or improvements, but they are focus areas where we should focus our attention on within the water blueprint. So thank you, everyone, for a very good discussion. Thank you to the panel, and I am told that lunch will now be from 1 to 2.15. Is that correct? 1 to 2.15 for lunch. Thank you very much. <laughs>